the Research and Innovation Office. I'd like to start off by welcoming all of you to the first event in our 2015-16 Mobilizing Research series. We're very excited about this series and we look forward to seeing everybody throughout the year at all of our different events, including this coming Monday, same time, same place. Uh, we'll be here for a discussion on the Tri-Council's new open access policy. The research office is proud to be hosting this series with our friends and our landlords, the library. Uh, today's event has been planned 100% by them <laughs> and was planned to correspond with the eighth annual Global Access Open Access Week. At this time, I'm just gonna hand things over to my co-organizers, Brian Selman and John Dobson. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. I'm happy to welcome you all to our panel um, and acknowledge that we're here today on Treaty One territory in the heart of the Métis Nation. The library is very excited to be part of the Mobilizing Research uh, series with the Research Office, and we look forward to many more collaborations. Collaboration, of course, is a word that you're going to be hearing a lot today because it is the theme of this year's Open Access Week, and it's the reason we've brought this esteemed panel together. So today's panel consists of Gabrielle Prefontaine, Dean of Libraries, uh, Gino DeStazio, oh God, he's got so many titles, but we'll stick with AVP Research and Innovation and Director of the Institute of Urban Studies, Leah McDonnell, who's the graduate UWSA rep, and Ian Morrow, who's a assistant, associate professor in the geography department. So, Open access is about making research content available for everyone, anywhere in the world. When the scholarly communications team, which is myself and John Dobson, started planning what we could do for this year's Open Access Week, we had an interesting challenge. The theme of this year's Global Open Access Week is open for collaboration, and we know that the University of Winnipeg is all about collaboration. If you guys were at the State of the University on Wednesday, you heard that a number of times. But while we may be doing fantastic things to increase community and research collaborations, and we strive to actively share our research, as an institution, we haven't necessarily had a clear path to what openness means. So this year, as the tri-agency policy went into effect, I think we have a really good opportunity to explore that um, and to think a little bit more deeply about open access, what the priorities are for us as researchers or as faculty, as students, but also which directions we want to explore <coughs> with intentionality. I think there's a lot of different options, different directions we can go in. And since we're talking about strategic directions as a university so much right now, we need to do that with open access as well. So today, each panelist will share some preliminary thoughts on open access coming from their different perspectives. Um, but then we'll have time to discuss and take some questions and of course, this panel isn't meant to be the definitive answer on open access for the University of Winnipeg, but it should be a way to spark some campus conversations and to get that, that ball rolling, I guess. So without further ado, we will start with Gabrielle Prefontaine. Thanks, Brianne. Um, I, I have to tell you I have a cold, so I was trying to decide between coughing or chewing on a lozenge while I talk, so I'm choosing the occasional coughing fit. Uh, I hope it isn't too bad. Um, I want to just start off by saying uh, thank you to the organizers of this event. It is truly exciting to be collaborating in this way. It's been great working with Gino to be thinking about some of these issues. Uh, libraries think about openness and open access a lot, and we've been thinking about it for a long time. Uh, Michael Honer's <laughs> in the audience here. Michael Honer was a lone wolf for a long time throwing open access events here during Open Access Week. Uh, knowing that, that it is a really important issue and has been for a long time. Uh, the principles of open access are very much in line with what libraries stand for. Uh, equal access to information uh, that's freely available with minimal barriers. Uh, it's why librarians are part of, you know, they're invited to comment on copyright modernization, to talk about user rights. Uh, it's why there was a big librarian and archivist lobby when the long form census was being canceled. Uh, it's why, sorry, <coughs> excuse me. It's why librarians are going to prisons to make sure inmates have uh, carefully curated reading materials. <laughs> um, 
And uh, so it's kind of, that's kind of our thing. Uh, and no matter what you say about open access or what angle you take about open access, I think everyone would agree that there is sort of, uh, it boils down to a public good imperative, this idea that public money going to research should, the public should enjoy the fruits of that spending. Um, but like most beautiful principles, it's <laughs> not necessarily that simple. There's another side of public good, which is research integrity, peer review, uh, all of these things that academics stand for. Um, and uh, we have come to sort of equate peer review with research integrity, and there's not much point in things being freely available if uh, the research is shoddy, and we have examples of what happens when shoddy research gets into the wrong hands. Um, and libraries care a lot about this too. We spend a lot of time and money taking the good stuff and the stuff that has integrity and making sure that it's discoverable and bringing it into a trustworthy, searchable space. It's one of the great things about libraries. And when librarians go to classrooms, they teach students about how to do research responsibly and how to access materials responsibly and to think about information responsibly. Um, so I just think it's important to talk about sort of those two sides of the public good a little bit and that we're thinking about both. Um, now the, the sort of big commercial publishers, sort of the top five would say, and these are the ones who we spend a lot of money licensing materials from, would say that their publishing model preserves research integrity and peer review and quality scholarship uh, through their model, through their manpower and their proprietary softwares and all of the ways that they make these things available, uh, paywalls and all of these things. Um, and to some degree, this has been very well argued and there's a reason why their profit uh, margins are so high and why on an annual basis they sometimes register profits in the 30 to 40 percent range on their uh, total sales and why they can justify raising their costs by five to seven percent every year. Um, but when you think about this from the sort of public good standpoint, it becomes almost comical when you think about how, how many times universities and taxpayers are paying for the same information. So uh, academics uh, research and they write about it, uh, salaries, workspaces, infrastructure come out of university operating budgets. They also come from public funding to a great degree from the tri-agencies. Uh, these come in large part from taxpayer dollars, <coughs> tuition dollars. Uh, authors give their work and their time as experts and editors to these publishers, sometimes, not always for free, and often relinquish their rights around how the material is used. Um, and then the kicker here is that the same operating budgets uh, that reside in libraries pay for licenses to access these materials. Um, and this is out of the same operating budget. So I sign invoices yearly to the tune of about a million or so dollars on databases, uh, and that's growing each year. And another kicker is now many of these journals are creating these open access hybrid models. Uh, within their subscription models, so they're still making a profit and they're charging authors, so another payment to process these articles. But at the end of the day, it is the library signing the invoices and uh, the publishers know this. Uh, and we're paying in US dollars and euros in large part. So we are assuming, we are solely assuming a, a really crippling risk, especially this year, on that. And so they know that we're their biggest client and they create these big bundles that allow us to license all of their titles, uh, whether or not we need them, but to, to purchase just a subset of titles that we do need, uh, surprise, surprise, costs more than actually subscribing to the whole set. So for many years now, academic libraries have formed consortia to kind of harness their buying power um, and influence to keep these costs down. Um, but in a way, this has really just reduced us to a situation of very little control where we're really just coming up with tactics on how to negotiate and keep the prices down. Um, I just got back yesterday from Ottawa from an AGM of the consortium 
uh, the biggest national consortium that we belong to. And uh, sorry, I'm going to cough again. <coughs> Uh, sitting in a room with uh, directors of libraries and collection librarians from all across the country. <coughs> and everyone's kind of wringing their hands and saying, you know, what are we going to do about this? Um, how am I for time? You looked at your watch. Am I over time? You're getting there. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Gina. <laughs> Um, so in these meetings, we're spending more time now talking about open access. And what that means is, is leveraging our power and influence in different ways to think about how we can actually look at funding the operations of strong, good, open access um, initiatives, initiatives that have peer review and integrity. There are a few examples that U of W pays into. Uh, RUD in Quebec is a consortium of Quebec universities. They're working with CALJ, the Canadian Association of Learned Journals. Uh, to come up with a nonprofit open access platform. Uh, so it's a, it's a different way to think about publishing models and the library role in that. There's something called Scope 3, uh, which is in the universe of particle physics. And basically, they're converting subscription money, if I'm understanding this properly, converting con subscription money to pay for open, uh, open access publishing instead. So that's kind of a big, that's sort of the big library narrative and there are all kinds of viewpoints on that. Uh, and you know, as Brianne said, we're in this room because we have a nice catalyst to be talking about open access beyond just a concept, but thinking about practical solutions for faculty here at U of W and keeping our eyes down the road on other issues of openness that are out there, uh, open data, which is right around the corner with the Tri-Council open educational resources, which is obviously a big issue for students and a real shift in how we're thinking about teaching and learning. And uh, those are, for, for our library anyway, we're just <coughs> thinking about, beginning to think about these things. So, thanks. Um, we were gonna go with Leah next, but is that? You ready to go? Uh, sure, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, you'll have to pardon me, my voice is a bit scratchy. I'm um, <coughs> Right? <laughs> um, so, Boju uh, Gitche Miigwech for inviting me here today. I'm really honored to be here. Um, pay respect to Treaty 1 territory and the heart of the Métis Nation that we're sitting on. And again, thank you all for showing up. This is really great. Um, I, uh, I was thinking about this and I wanted to approach this with kind of two perspectives. And the first is as a human rights practitioner and the second is a graduate student. And from my experience in the field, working in human rights and being an advocate and, and doing that kind of stuff, education is so highly prized and it's so valuable and it really makes a difference for people who are in dire situations that are trying to access that education. So the idea of having something that's open and available for people um, makes a big difference and it's very, very important. And. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of personal stories or a lot of experiences with individuals who were trying to better their selves, better their situations, even trying to flee dictatorships or authorities um, <clears throat> and accessing refugee status. And then in the area that they were uh, trying to, you know, kind of maybe it wasn't the best scenario for them and trying to um, get away from that. And education was one of the key ways that they could do that but they had to be able to properly prepare themselves for the kind of the Western education system that we're looking at. And this open access can provide that. And uh, I think that that's really important to point out. So the second hat that I'll wear today is as a graduate student. Um, and one thing that I know is in graduate studies, we are so competitive. Um, we have, you know, I have a great group of students that I work with, but we are highly competitive and we are always working for that scholarship, for that grade for that publish, or getting that published. And I think the availability to have a little bit of calm or a little bit of space to be able to publish something without going through kind of the steps that we have to take to get something published, or having more ability to be able to have our things published um, is incredible. It creates more of a community, it uh, solidifies the knowledge that we're all trying to work at and what we're trying to get. And I think that um, it's incredibly advantageous. Um, 
I'm really fortunate to be at the University of Winnipeg as a graduate student, and I'm very happy to be here. But it's a bit stressful. It's, there are long hours, there are hard days, there's a lot of stuff that we have to do. So open access kind of gives us the ability to go through the steps that we have to take to publish something, because we will. We will get our stuff reviewed. We will look into our peers. We will edit. We will, you know, do the best that we can. But um, kind of taking off some of the pressure and being able to use a source, one for, you know, to cite our own papers that we're trying to get in, or being able to use this source as a place that we can put our knowledge, all the things that we've been studying, everything that we've been trying to do, without these kind of ridiculous steps that you have to go through otherwise, um, it makes us feel kind of good. And I think that that positivity would equate to an externality of more people trying to do that, more knowledge getting out there. And that's really important. Um, and the last thing I'll touch on is the idea of integrity. Um, Allowing us access to this as graduate students or as undergraduate students, I, I don't think will diminish the integrity in which we will be writing or, or the process that will go into to writing this to make sure that it's, it's the paper that we want to have out there. I think that um, even in my undergrad, I remember you know, my professor saying, when you go to get something, it has to be peer reviewed. It has to be this. You have to have from this journal. Look at here. So this was the first step in kind of guiding me as a young student into understanding how to think critically about journals, about books, about articles. And that was a learning process that I went through, and it's now something that I think I can impart when I'm writing. And I have to tell you, um, I've read a lot of terrible things that were peer reviewed that had great check marks that were, oh, you should, this is the base of knowledge to be at. And when you read them critically, you're like, oh my goodness, this is awful. Or I totally uh, disagree with this. I have a divergent viewpoint. And that's something great that can be fostered. Um, but that, that critical thinking, I don't think will go away because you know, we have open access to this. I think, or I believe, that the more access we have to that, the more critical thinkers will become. And that comes not just guidance with our professors, but ourselves in understanding what type of academia or what type of resources we want. So um, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm very on board for the idea of open access. So thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, happy to be here and uh, share the sentiments of uh, many of the sentiments that have been presented thus far. Um, I come at this from a student perspective. I remember the first time I signed away my copyright when I wanted to get a peer-reviewed paper uh, in publication. And I remember how awkward that was. I worked so hard on this thing. You know, I'm a graduate student and I'm in the stroke of a pen going to sign the rights to this to a publication uh, because that's the model that we operate in. And that transfer of knowledge, that transfer of ownership, uh, I think the normalization of it has become pervasive in the academic world. And it's important that we question that because the, the autonomy of knowledge in today's society is so important. How we craft our ideas, who owns those ideas, um, those are tremendous uh, starting points for how society unfolds. And so I think this kind of idea of questioning the firewalls of knowledge is really important because those of us that have spent time in academic institutions know that we are very privileged to have access to certain kinds of knowledge because of the institutions that we work within and because of the infrastructure around these inf institutions that allow us to go on a network in this university and access the cutting edge ideas of our time. If you're a person on the street who has an education, maybe has a master's, maybe even has a PhD, but doesn't have a subscription to these journals, to these databases, you don't have access to the cutting edge ideas of our time. You have Google, and we know how dicey that can be. And so the firewalls of knowledge that exist today, at present, across society, challenge the equitable 
future for all people. If you don't have access to knowledge, you are at a disadvantage. We know that in the knowledge economy, the knowledge society that we live in. And so this idea of creating open access for the ability to have equitable knowledge across time and space, diverse places with diverse people having access to it is tremendously important. And I think that I am also in support of that. I in part started on my path as an academic uh, and moving into multimedia because it democratized knowledge. You didn't need a master's to read, you know, some technical paper. You could watch a film. You could absorb ideas in different ways. And for me, that was very important. So I went into film. I became a filmmaker. I kind of live in both worlds. I've had the opportunity to have millions of people watch the academic products that we make through video. And so for me, there's, it's not just libraries, it's not just written words, there's other ways of doing this that I think are important. I think we need to enshrine in universities, we need to acknowledge our important ways of disseminating information, that knowledge mobilization. But ironically, I also feel conflicted around it because you have a situation where we are paying multiple times over for this knowledge that is being created we have public institutions funding, you know, public purse funding these institutions, academics, you know, students paying, academics paying page fees to publish, and then we are buying it back from ourselves. It's what's happening. You, if you think about it for a second, it's insane, but that's what's happening. And I, I challenge that, I think that's not a good idea. But we've swung the pendulum the other way. And so open access, the way it's being defined right now, I'm surprised there's not more people in these seats because it challenges the fundamental ways that academics will operate on an ongoing basis. If you have to write or do your research, collect data and make sure that it's publicly available, think about what that means for you as a student, as a, as a researcher, as an institution. What do you do with the databases? You go into the spreadsheets that you have for your projects if you're a quantitative scientist, imagine that you have to provide that in an open sphere. It's like dirty laundry. We all know what they look like, all our multiple spreadsheets, and oh, you know which piece of data you've cleaned up and makes sense. But if you have to show that to the world, what kind of responsibility do you have to repackage that, repurpose it? It's a whole other job to make open access viable. And that requires resources. That requires a lot of resources. You know, I work in video. So I have, for any one project, probably six terabytes of video data. How do I make that available? You almost cannot do it. So there's an impossible request at some level for certain kinds of projects to make this data available unless there's a process in place to, you know, take the cream off the top and share that. So we have to think about, okay, what does it actually mean? We can have platitudes about this is amazing, but how do you do it? And doing it is actually a really tough question. And the other thing that I'll, I'll close on is that open access sounds like a good idea in theory, but in practice in certain communities, it's also incredibly dangerous. And I'll share a conversation that I had uh, yesterday with some indigenous partners that I have on the West Coast. They took us this past summer to sacred sites all through British Columbia's west coast in the, in the sunshine's kind of, or in the central coast of BC. We were going to sacred sites with these elders who had trust in us, they wanted us to videotape it, they wanted it to be spatially referenced for their future genera generations of, of health sick people. And now some broad open access policy says that has to be shared? I don't think so. The communities don't want that. It was very clear. And so all of a sudden, if there's an imposition of open access, what does that mean for particular communities that we work with did, that don't want that information shared openly? How do you manage the politic of whose knowledge it is when we're being told it all has to be openly available? And so I think there's really serious technical questions, but there's very serious political questions around how you do this effectively, how you do it fairly, how you do it with integrity, because it's far more complicated than let's just have open information in a better society. There are lots of questions about how that's achieved. Thanks. Getting the last word means I can just say I, I agree with everybody and not add much. 
But I'll take a, a little bit of a different view, and I'll try to narrate a story about a small academic journal that's caught in the middle of all this. And I always use uh, an example now. I've been using this for the last little while. Uh, how many people have bought uh, a song from iTunes? Spent your $2, right? And how long have artists been arguing about the slice of that $2 that goes to the artist that goes to Apple? That's been an ongoing discussion. But if you flip the table and say, put that same kind of concept to an academic article, and you say, okay, so I go to my iTunes and I buy an article by Ian, and I pay the $2, and Apple says, okay, Ian, thank you for the content, all the work. Um, I'm not gonna give you anything back, but I'm gonna take one hundredth of a penny and I'm gonna give it to somebody else. And that's kind of the model right now that we face as a small journal at the Institute of Urban Studies and the Canadian Journal of Urban Research. We work as hard as we can to produce the highest quality, academic, peer-reviewed, time-consuming effort to publish every single article that we have in 60 issues and hundreds of articles that have now been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. And every piece of that content goes further and further away from our journal, which, as we all know on this campus, runs on fumes, runs on Michelle's uh, uh, power, one person. And I always challenge people who uh, say open access is the way to go, and I, and I believe it is. And on the other end of this, you know, the Institute of Urban Studies, we're closing in on 500 publications. Uh, many of those uh, lovingly put up on the wind space, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, all those reports from 1969 to now, we are slowly ratcheting that up. But on the other end, what people keep forgetting is that this content is not produced for free. Um, as we've all said, it starts with the, the uh, faculty member getting a grant, having an idea, producing a, a paper, that paper going to a journal, that journal then being peer reviewed, that journal then being uh, page set and laid out and edited and back and forth, and then finally published. And the real fight isn't necessarily with the small uh, mom and pop sh type of journals like we operate, but it's the ones in which these database companies have just taken over. So I, I just, I'm, I'm, uh, for whatever, I'm, maybe it's not Apple, but sort of that same framework, if you keep thinking about that, saying, well, how have we created a system where these database companies can, can take all the profits? billions of dollars being paid by libraries to buy back and bypass even the journals. So sometimes you have this fight that it's the journals. Well, it's the journals that are owned by the, uh, the publishing databases. It's not the small little journals like we run. And if somebody can tell me a model to just fund one person to get our high quality journal out, hundreds of articles produced since 1993, we're going into our 25th year of struggle for every subscriber because you know what, unfortunately, Students don't want to subscribe. Faculty members don't want to subscribe. They don't want to pay. They think somehow that you right click in Google or in Google Scholar and that article should just appear for free onto their desktop to be cited and sourced, which is great. But for a lot of the journals and for the academics, at least on our end, somebody still has to take that spoken word, written word, you know, visualized word and get it into the hands of people. And it's, it's a kind of a partnership along the way. And we've been cut out. Uh, we need either a, a change in funding that allows journals to have access to supports to publish high quality journals so we don't have to sell out. And in fact, it's, it's amazing. And uh, is that Jillian up there? I mean, how many times have we been called in the last year by these proprietary databases that actually want to buy our journal? Let us take it over for you. We'll give you, and it's another deal with the devil. We signed a deal with the devil and EBSCOhost and ProQuest and all these big databases who take and market our articles. And in a given year, we get 100,000 downloads and we get hundreds of dollars for that. That doesn't keep a journal open. And those same hundreds of dollars were the result of millions and millions of dollars in federal research grants to researchers like us all around the table and in this room. We produce the materials yet we pass it on at no cost. What business model in this world runs on free input, free labor, free production, free costing, and just here's the final product? And just think of Apple saying, all the bands in the world just said to Apple, here, here's our music. Uh, we paid 10 grand a song to produce, to do all the album covers, everything. It's yours, make what you can. It just wouldn't work. 
Because musicians have said no, but academics seem to think, here's my stuff, thank goodness you're publishing it, um, and we haven't even opened up the door of proprietary journals and all the rest of the things, but it's just a model that is functionally not working. And at the end of the day, you're writing a check for a million dollars, and I am not getting a nickel of that. And you're not getting a nickel of that, and if we say we don't even need a nickel, and you take that million dollars and you support the Canadian Journal of Urban Research and all the small journals, and we just produce on our own and just get it out there, then the model can work. But somehow right now, there's, we've taken a detour, and that detour has been to the, to the massive database companies that have taken over academic publishing and owning, I don't know what percentage of academic research that's been published in this country. But it is not owned by faculty members, it's not owned by universities, it's not owned by small journals, it's owned by multinational companies. And I think I'll end there. <laughs> so I, I think that's a good direction to maybe go with, with a little bit more discussion is this kind of question of maybe open access itself isn't a red herring, but maybe the way we've been told to look at it, well, just pay $3,000 to Elsevier and you can make your article open access. Maybe there's been a red herring somewhere there along the way that's avoiding those fundamental principles, the, the, the fundamental principle of public good, of democratization of knowledge, and does that actually increase in the current model and if it does, at, at what kind of cost, I guess. I, I could give you all sorts of stats about <laughs> profits and things like that, but you're certainly right, Gino, in that the people making the profits are Elsevier and Springer and Wiley, and I can tell you all of their profit margins. <laughs> but, but it's then, not the small journals and it's not Canadian content. Right, I mean, and just to that, just a quick thought is that, you know, at the end of the day, then we have this publisher Paris mentality in which faculty have been preyed upon by journals at cost as well. So, oh, give me $500 and uh, you know, we'll, we'll publish that, uh, that article and it'll be done very quickly, by the way, you know, in whatever uh, journal. And thanks to Michael and the work of the library and just even bringing to my attention the pervasiveness of these types of journals that have infiltrated universities across the globe in which young faculty are preyed upon, and I've gotten many emails, I don't know how many I've flipped, oh, you know, Mr. Distazio, we would love to publish and then, you know, send us 500 and we love your research and it's just this broken language. And so young academics on the tenure track uh, train wreck in some ways are forced into this. Oh, wow, somebody's taken an interest in me? $500 a week? Wow, they must have really liked my work. Yet Maggie Simpson uh, publishes an article of uh, gibberish in whatever journal. And then we all react to, to not in the right manner. So the entire, we have to take a step back even before we get to all this. So yes, yeah, so how do we at the U of W proceed intentionally with an open access route that, that is kind of defining maybe more principles than just straight away? Did you wanna? Well, I just, I, I think that we haven't really explained what's happening, they, the tri-councils are going to mandate that open access has to be part of how research funding that's allocated is, is, is carried out. And so publish or perish, you know, we are forced into an open access model very quickly if those funds, if, if we're lucky enough to access those funds. And the, again, when I say the pendulum has swung the other way, I don't think that they've necessarily thought out how complicated it actually is. So there's, there's this massive kind of elephant in the room in that we wanna be competitive, we wanna get these research dollars and we don't have a pathway to actually figure out how it works except to pay. Because the way it's gonna work is these journals offer, oh, well you can get this extra package to make open access possible and it's a requirement of your funding so we know that you actually have to fund extra money into this stream and, and, and it, it just becomes the profit model over and over again. It's open access, yes, it sounds great, but it actually reinforces the problem of the universities having to pay to have a politically correct and optically nice world that we want to live in. And it doesn't actually solve the underlying problem, which is there is a concerted effort to profitize on knowledge and on public sector knowledge. And if we don't get at the underlying problems, we don't get at real solutions. Um, and I'll say too that 
um, I think in some ways, uh, you know, there's this sort of government endorsement of open access manifesting in these tri-council requirements and great, you're allowed to uh, include the cost of article processing fees in your grant application, but there isn't really anything being done at a governmental level, at a central level, about addressing this sort of, well, talk about structural deficits. I mean, we talk about that on campus, this sort of really terrible structural problem and the inequity between, you know, the, the sort of oligarchy that's going on. And there's, so there's nothing, there's no, we don't have, we don't have an avenue to solve it. We're just told that we have to do it. So there has to be more built into that. And I think, and I, I, I don't know enough about this probably to comment on it, but I think that in the UK and in other jurisdictions, government has seen the bigger picture and there, is, there are much more sort of publicly centralized approaches to scholarly communication because they probably understood that you can't have one without addressing the other. Well, I think that's a really good example. So the UK was way ahead in this curve and made it a necessary part of funding when I was doing my master's there. So that was like 10 years ago now. But uh, I just looked at the numbers for 2014 and the Wellcome Trust, so they fund a huge amount of scientific and medical research in the UK. They spent over a billion dollars on article processing charges to Elsevier in one year. So that public grant money now is again being sent back to a company that has somewhere between a 37 and 45 percent profit margin, most of which is coming from scholarly journal publication. It's, it's uh, an interesting new profit model and I think that that wasn't something that the UK had foreseen in their policies but it's something that we have 10 years of extra history we should have maybe seen coming. Well, I mean, but uh, it's interesting timing now. I mean, given the events of uh, this week and the change in government means that people do have to, uh, even as academics, I mean, we do have to lobby. We have to work with our, our, our federal uh, partners now and, and looking at how Tri-Council has changed their policies uh, under the Harper government, as he liked to use all the time, and now he's paid the price for that, that he muzzled researchers and he cut funding and he did this and he did that. So now, uh, I think, as faculty and as others, we need to uh, address a decade of closed libraries. Uh, the NRC building behind us is emptied. Uh, the researchers at the, uh, at the Grain uh, Council, uh, they're gone. Uh, PhDs have left this city. Uh, we've got an empty building, a state-of-the-art uh, science building where researchers were looking at things. And then Scott Forbes today is talking about zebra mussels in absence of any federal um, you know, we should almost had a task force on zebra mussels led by the federal government, and yet now we've got op-eds and papers saying, you know, what have you guys been doing? Um, so this all stems from just sort of a, a shakedown in a dark period in funding uh, research and education in this country, and I think we need to try to find a, a way out. And I don't know that a change in government is going to make much of a difference, but at least they start with a fresh page and, and maybe we can increase tri-council funding, maybe we can increase the lobbying efforts to change the model because it's not working for small journals, it's not working for academics, and it's certainly not working for universities and libraries. The model is broken, it just cannot continue to function this way. We're going down a path that is just non-sustainable. Yeah. I just want to make one more, one final comment. I think maybe it'd be nice to hear from people in the audience too. But the 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 interesting thing here is that whenever there's a really complex challenge, there's also a really excellent space for creating innovative solutions. And I think small universities like the University of Winnipeg, you know, out on the forefront of this, having a panel, you know, talking about these things. You know, I think we have an opportunity to also build some really interesting solutions here on campus. And, you know, the library is a key part of this. You know, Gino's office and the research office, you know, we, Gino and I were talking, you know, about the importance of that digital infrastructure because a lot of this stuff is all digital. And if you don't have a digital backbone that has a, a, a real opportunity to aggregate information in this kind of global digital space that we live in, you're, you're almost reliant on these service providers. You're reliant on Google. You're reliant on the database management companies. And so there's an opportunity to try and 
solidify some of that capacity here and, and think really differently about how knowledge operates within <laughs> our space, within the space that we work in. And starting small and, and thinking big can go a long way. And I think that these types of conversations, you know, if the university starts to commit to trying to create interesting opportunities that, that, that lead the way, you know, maybe, maybe you're looking at the next Steve Jobs right here. <laughs> Well, at the very, <laughs> at the very yeah. least, you know, we can write a letter to the new chief science officer that's supposed to exist and maybe right. give some suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, but do other people want to jump in with comment or with questions or, yeah, go, Larissa? And I, th I think that's a really good point, is that I think we've perhaps allowed open access to become a proxy for that conversation that we should maybe be having about nonprofit publication. Because there are institutes and societies, and they do charge article processing fees often to cover their costs, but their art article processing fees are around $200. And university presses tend to be a little bit higher. Actual just university-run journals tend to be a little bit lower. They're in this average of around $500 range for an article processing charge, which might accurately cover some of the costs that Gino and, and that you guys have. That's very different than a $3,000 article processing charge. Uh, and there's arguments on both sides. But again, when there's a 40% profit margin, I'm not as sympathetic, maybe, to some of those. Uh, <laughs> um, any, anyone else, or did anyone else want to respond? Yeah. What would be the idea of using free repositories to put unformatted publications into? So um, you mean institutional repositories? So we do have one at U of W uh, that was started a number of years ago, and we've kind of updated it. Uh, and uh, John John Dobson's role in in tech services in the library has shifted a little bit too. He's kind of providing the uh, some of the technical expertise around that technical support. Um, I won't. He's too modest. I won't talk about how he is a scholar in his own right and writes articles in math journals for fun, but that's an aside. Um, so Brianne is working, is working uh, with John a lot and with Michael in our systems department to make sure that that infrastructure is there, but uh, with that, you need there to be buy-in and you need there to be a culture of doing it. And you probably need a campus-wide open access policy, which is something that we've been talking about, and Concordia has done it quite successfully. Gerald Beasley, who is the university librarian there, is now He's now in, at U of A, and he's a really big proponent of that, too. So there are models for doing that on campuses, and I can't see how that wouldn't be part of this bigger conversation in building that infrastructure. There are also subject-based open access repositories out there as well. Um, not as many as there, as there should be, but they are growing. And for research data, too, the sort of subject-based world of repositories is growing as well, and one of the roles of the library uh, is to make sure that at the beginning of the research process, uh, academics understand what, what their options are as they enter into this sort of realm of making things available. Uh, I think the library and research office have a very, very important role here in sort of guiding people through the scholarly communication cycle, the data management cycle, the archiving cycle. Richard's here. Uh, he is, is going to have to be thinking about, and I know is already thinking about creating that infrastructure to have the sort of digital capability to do these things. So it's really 
it's about collaboration or theme and it's really that kind of big picture. Um, and I'll just say one more quick thing is that you know, U of W hasn't really been in the business of publishing, but we have a lot of journal, small journals on campus. The library supports some of those through the open journal system, uh, which is part of the public knowledge project, right? Um, right. And uh, we don't, we've, we've done all of these things as kind of one-offs because we knew it was the right thing to do. Um, but we probably need to be, and we've talked about this with Mavis and Gino, we need to be having a bigger conversation about about how to do these things if we're going to be in the business of doing them. Mm -hmm. And, and just, is, oh, just, I just was gonna say thing. a short answer. In terms of institutional repository archiving does count with the tri-agency as long as you haven't completely given up your copyright and your ability to do that. And that, again, comes back to a lot of an education piece. Most people don't realize when they've published an article that they don't have the ownership of that research anymore, and possibly would, would be prohibited from even a preprint. So. But just the one thing we, we just can't lose sight is the, the one thing that sorts out peer-reviewed articles are good quality journals that have good staff, good reputation, and a good peer review process. So in our case, after 25 years, you know, Michelle has a, a, a slate of high quality global leaders in peer review. And I think if we move too far in the direction of, of opening everything and saying, oh, well, just self-publish and self-produce, that doesn't necessarily allow the quality of, of certain journals to come up. And I think what's been broken is not the high-quality journals. It's how journals have been bought by these large conglomerates and then folded into something that aren't independent research journals that have their own boards and their own ability to manage themselves. That's a challenge. Just the one other thing, though, on the open access data piece that's very intriguing, I'm also involved in a large study of, uh, of mental health and homelessness. And what we've done with our database, we've done 40,000 interviews with individuals in five Canadian cities and amassed a database of several hundred million pieces of information, hundreds of millions of pieces of information. So what we've done is created a repository at uh, St. Michael's Hospital, and we've created a, a team to vet international requests to get to that data. So we've put up our own firewall, where we've, we've certainly said the data is available, but you must present your case to get to the data, because we will not just make it available, because it is very sensitive, and you need to come with a credible reason to access that data and use it for research purposes. And, but that's vastly expensive. We had a budget of $100 million, so how do we vet how that data is used, manipulated, changed, uh, re-engineered, whatever you want to say, uh, so it's not just these, sometimes these policies get a little out of hand. Oh yeah, great, great to have open access and open data, but who's paying for that? Uh, Richard is up there probably shaking when, when you're talking about terabytes of data that get moved and now have to be freely available. Well, well how? And I think again, government have, have sort of lost their way in really understanding the needs of researcher by imposing these sort of top-down uh, narratives on us of how research should go and how it should be distributed. We're pretty good at distributing research. We've always been well uh, accessed for openness and sharing information. Now these, these directives come down and they don't come with the right sets of rules and responsibilities and funding. Nobody's giving Richard money, nobody's giving you money to make all this data available. But what happens if tomorrow 500, are, we've crashed your system uh, <laughs> loading it up. Uh, what happens when we put terabytes of data and video? Who's going to manage that? Yeah, I think one of the things, rights is really important. Like faculty members need to understand their rights because the way in which the open access policies seem to be carved out and what the, what the, where the publishers are starting to cave a bit is they are allowing, okay, well a year, we get it for a year and then you can have it in this open access stream or on your website or at your university repository. And again, there's, I think, an opportunity to push into that space a little bit further. There's an opportunity to push on Shirk and the Tri-Councils and say, hey, like, are you thinking about this? Um, and, and create an opportunity to make a, a, the best of a, a challenging situation in the short term. Um, but that gets down to real education, like faculty rights, like we need to know, okay, don't check that box or, you know, push back on that particular, you know, publication because they will realize that they can't allow that to just 
be glossed over anymore. People are getting too savvy. Faculty members, universities, consortiums are saying, no, that's not how this is going to roll. And I think there's a lot of agency in that, that awareness at different levels in that kind of academic system because as soon as there's a, a strong front around that, the power is these publishers don't have the knowledge unto themselves. They are reliant on us. And as soon as we take back that power, they will come in line with what is expected uh, in today's society around open access. And, and that is something that John and I will talk a little bit about on Monday and is kind of part of the purpose behind we've merged scholarly communications and copyright now, so I'm <coughs> both. And I think we've done a really good job of focusing on users' rights for copyright here at the university, but we haven't focused on authors' rights as much. And so I, that is part of the kind of plan for the next year is to, to kind of get people to exercise some of those rights a little bit more and, and just even simply understand them. Understand that you could be signing away <laughs> your research uh, and, and looking at other models and ways to explore that. Because I think that brings us back to something that was a thread through what everyone was talking about, that there's a very good principle at play, the principle of, of human rights, of allowing information to be out there, to give people that power. But perhaps, you know, sorry, there's a little bit of that Marxist in me that thinks that capitalism has corrupted it. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we take the power back? But I, I think in a practical way, too, not just, I'm not going to go waving flags. <laughs> Maybe I'll go waving flags. Anyone else got a flag? Yeah, yeah software to manage your peer review process, what would that look like? Or is there any kind of, can you talk about that? What you're doing? Uh, let me just, uh, yeah, but I mean, that exists, but it's still, the, the software does not go out and, and find individuals who are of high caliber to review stuff. Software sends out emails and reminders and attracts things, and it's all great. It's been revolutionary, and we're, and we're shifting into that. But it's that personal touch of a quality journal that is uh, working with authors, just like a small record label, right? The small record label that takes an interest in that, uh, that artist. They work together, they collaborate, they produce, and they market. So why can't the journal be involved in that software, and then they can do the peer, peer review process for any article? You, you know what, at the end of the day, for most small journals, and maybe Larissa, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and Michelle, if each journal that's about the scale and scope of the ones that we produce here, maybe a little bit bigger, if somebody finds me a model that gives me about $75,000 a year to pay for about a full-time and change staff member to produce a few really good quality uh, article, uh, journal um, issues per year, that would be problem solved for a lot of journals. Somebody still has to pay the staff time to press buttons, uh, to program, so to do whatever. Somebody, we still have not fixed that part of all that, this open access. Where does that money come from then, then, for the journals? Well, let's say for, for my journal, for the Canadian, well, my, our journal, the Canadian Journal of Urban Research, we just eat the cost of, of staff production time in, in other ways. It's a huge, this is why so many journals get swallowed up. They don't have the staff ability to, to hang on. How the hell we've lasted for 25 years, I don't know. Uh, we shouldn't be here anymore. Um, I don't know, Janess, I mean, I mean, I think it's the same kind of struggle. You try to find ways to pay for basically one person. And imagine if you got more of that money. So the proportion that you're even getting in your nonprofit world, I mean, everybody thinks nonprofit means nonprofit. You know what? I mean, that's debatable too. So if you're getting 20 grand, there's uh, several hundred thousand that's moving somewhere else, and it's not in our hands. So all I'm saying is don't be. Um, don't judge small journals because just like small record labels, we play an integral part in creating and contributing to scholarly knowledge and development in Canada. But we too need some funding, and that's faculty-led. Like you know, our um, our editor Mark Vashon on geography, a small stipend. Um, we don't run on a lot, and you can still produce a very high-quality journal. But somebody has to pay for that as well. Um, so that model, I don't know. Well, and then there's the erudite model, which we've talked about a couple of times, because that is something that the library jumped into without a clear strategy necessarily or a clear commitment, but 
I'm the subject librarian for French, so I pushed for it. But Erudit came to CRKN and asked, we would like to continue surviving, we would like to continue to provide open access to Canadian research, particularly French Canadian research. Can the libraries of Canada, instead of paying a subscription every year, can you provide us with a little bit more so that we can move to an open access model? And that was something that we decided to do, but it, it's a huge commitment too of our budget to do that as well. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Brianna, and I'll just add to that, that there's been this kind of growing trend of libraries having authors' funds, so funds to support authors and pay their article processing fees to, as sort of a way to contribute to open access. Um, and this is kind of on the wane now, because I think a lot of libraries are realizing that that maybe isn't the best way to use our money, if we want to think about open access, supporting the operations of a non-for-profit like AIRUD or contributing to something like Scope 3 and other projects out there is, um, has a much bigger impact because at the end of the day, managing an author's fund is kind of turns into a kind of a granting process almost and you're giving out money to, you don't have money for everyone and you're just contributing to that machine a little bit more. So. Uh, in the library, we've been thinking a lot about what do we meaningfully do towards open access and with our very small budget have tried in these small ways through these consortia to contribute to projects like this that will have a longer term impact. I think we're at time, but uh, if anyone has more questions, I'm sure we'll still be around. and. And there is the event on Monday as well, which will be a more practical focus on the actual policy that we have right now to work with, which is the tri-agency policy. So John and I will talk about different ways that we can meet that and some of the principles that we want to employ when we're seeking solutions. So thank you all very much for coming and for watching. And keep the fire burning. And maybe I will go out with a flag if anyone wants.